So Moses leaves Egypt and he has an entire people following him. And there are some things that they've got to work out as they go. If you're going to move that many people, and you've got 12 tribes of thousands of people each, first you've got to work out how you're going to march. And that's the first thing we just heard, or the, what we just heard. And on the front of your bulletin and on the screen, you can see, like, that, that's how they were told they were going to march. You had Reuben and Simeon and God to the south, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim to the west. And, and we didn't read all of where all the tribes were, because... I admit this is a chunk of numbers that will put you to sleep if I had read about if about three more verses had been read. It, it's not the most invigorating part of, of Scripture. But it is important. It's important to know how you're going to organize people as you're marching. However, it's not the most important part of what we're reading in Scripture at this point. What's far more important is the thing that seems even more random. Like, if you're going to move a lot of people to know their marching order, that's obvious. You would expect that. But what's this about an ox? What's this about slaves, right? This is, that's, this is the meat, right? What we read in Exodus, it, what we just read, Exodus 21, is far more important, but we have to understand the context of where they're coming from to, to make sense of it. First it says, if you hit your servant or your slave, the word can be translated either way, if you hit the person who's serving you so hard that you knock a tooth out or you, knock an, or you destroy their eye, they're going to be freed. Right? Why do you need to say that? Well, let's think about where they come from. The Hebrew people have been in slavery. They were in slavery. Their parents were in slavery. Their grandparents were in slavery. And they've been in slavery for a long time. And if an Egyptian guard hits a, a Hebrew slave so hard that it knocks a tooth out, what happens? Nothing. They come back. They work again tomorrow. Right? The Egyptian guard told you what to do, you didn't do it, knock a tooth out, you learned your lesson, you'll do better next time, right? That's how slavery tends to work. And so now the Hebrew people, they're traveling, and now they have this, uh, for the first time, they have, they're going to be in charge of people. It could be that some of them are going to have servants or, or slaves, and let's not get into the nature of, of far Middle East ancient slavery, let's, but they'll be in charge of people. And what have they seen it look like to be in charge of people? What they've seen is an Egyptian guard, if you don't do what I tell you right away, I'll hit you, and if I knock the, your tooth out, I'll knock it, so what? Right? Let's just acknowledge, you've got to hit someone pretty hard to knock a tooth out. Right? And so, what this is saying is that if you treat someone so badly that it causes permanent damage to them. Like, notice it says, knock a tooth out or destroy an eye. Like, it's starting, it's, it's not like you can do anything you want for the people that serve you. Hit them however hard you want, wherever you want, just don't hit their eyes. Like, it goes through, it says a few things, like eye or tooth, and it's sort of implied. Like, if you do permanent damage, if you cause them to, like, lose a hand, if you cause permanent damage to a slave because you can't handle your anger, you don't get to have that servant or that slave anymore. That's how we're going to do things now. You got to leave the past behind. You got to leave how you saw power used before. And we're going to learn a new way of doing things because so, we're going to a new land and we're going to have to learn a new way before we get there. We're not going to be like we were in Egypt. We're heading to something new. Got to let go of that past. Ox, it's the same type of thing. If you were in Egypt, and you're an Egyptian, and you have so many slaves under your control that you are worried about slave revolts. You have so many slaves under your control that you can try to, do, try to control how many, boys, how many boys are born because you're worried that they're going to revolt, right? You have that many slaves. You have enough slaves to build entire cities. If you have that many slaves, and you have an ox, which is more valuable to you? A slave that can be re replaced easily, or an ox. And if an ox takes out a few slaves, so what? An ox can, how much can an ox carry? I don't know. 
But like, think of ox as like the ancient John Deere. Like, they, that's their tractors. That's what they do everything with, right? And so if I have to choose between the ox and a few slaves, if the ox has a nasty habit of, of gouging slaves, then so what? The ox is worth it. And, and so again, now, now they're traveling, and, and they have stuff that they need to carry. And they, they, they took some oxes, oxen with, with them when they, they started traveling. And what they have seen is livestock matters more than people. So if you have an ox now, and it gouges someone, it kills them, what are you going to do? Well, what it tells us in Scripture you have to value the life of your neighbor more than the life of the ox, which is not what they would have seen in Egypt. In Egypt, it was the ox was more important. And so now they have to learn this lesson that you have to value the life of your neighbor, like love your neighbor. Okay, practically, what's it look like? What it looks like is if your ox is killing people, you have to put it down. And if you don't put it down, the next time it kills someone, you're going to die for it because you purposely kept an ox alive that was killing people. Yeah, love your neighbor is easy until it costs you something, right? And so that's what this, they have to learn. They have to leave that past behind of, in Egypt where the ox was more important than any slaves. Now we're going to learn a different way. We're going to leave that past behind. We're going to learn a way that says that people are more important than livestock. And, and think about how much you would lose, too. If you're the dude who has an ox and your ox, it's not like you have a whole lots of them. If like one of your one or two or three ox, oxen that you have, kill someone think about how much capacity you lose if you have to put down an ox that's quite the sacrifice but that's how they're going to live now that's something they have to learn that's some, some part of leaving the past behind so that they can learn something something better think about how many ways slavery would have warped and harmed these people Think about all the ways that, that that would have happened, right? Think about, like, work. Do slaves get a day off? No. And so they have to be told, you will take a day off. Sabbath. Because you are more than your work. You have to Sabbath. You have to take a day to rest. And if you work all the time and you never stop working, then you were enslaved to something and you are no longer slaves. Right? Think about how conflicts were resolved. Conflicts were resolved by whoever the Egyptian guard decided was right. And so now they've got to learn a different way of judging who is right and wrong. And it's interesting, like there's this moment when uh, Moses is judging between all of them because they're doing what they learned, right? You go, if there's a problem, you go to the authority figure. You go to the person who's above you. You go to the Egyptian guard. And so... And the Hebrew people are traveling, they're all going to Moses, who's above them, who has all the authority. And they're asking him, what they, should they do? And, and Jephthah, Moses' father-in-law, shows up and says, this is crazy. Train some people to do the judging for you. You shouldn't have to do all of this. But that didn't even occur to them. Why? Because they, wouldn't, they weren't trusted to judge. And now they are told, you know, this is how we're going to live. We're going to lift some people up to be the people who judge what is right and wrong. And so it, it's how uh, work, it's conflict, it's worship. In, in Egypt, they had worshipped gods that were made of stone. And if you made the correct sacrifices to these stone gods, then the, the gods would give you what you wanted. And so you sacrifice to this god and you'd have a good harvest. You sacrifice to that god and you'd have children. And, and to, now they're going to practice a, a new way. They're leaving behind that past and they're going to live worshipping a god that they cannot see and they cannot control. Like, so all of these changes that they have to learn, you start to get this sense of what's going on here. And, and it, it's remembering this that helps, that helps me stay awake when reading these books of the Bible, because I have to confess, I have fallen asleep more times than I care to admit while reading Leviticus, the latter half of Exodus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Man, I have snoozed on top of my Bible many times. And, and for me to be able to, to, to what I focus on is, how is this training people to live as God's community against how they had been living in Egypt? 
Right? How is this training people out of their past and towards what, what God is, is desiring uh, of them? That, that's what helps me, at least. And, and how long does it take for them to learn this? Like, think about that. How long does it take for an entire people to learn a new way of life? So this is what happens. They get, in Numbers 13, they get to the edge of the promised land, and they pick 12 spies, 12 scouts. And they send those 12 scouts in, and those 12 scouts, they go across all the land of Palestine, and they come back and they say, it's really good. It's really good. The grapes are fertile. Gra grape clusters are huge. The land is fertile. The crops are like, just amazing, amazing land. And it's full of these people who all seem to be a lot taller and bigger than us. And if we go in there, they're going to whoop us. Right? That's what 11 of the 12 spies says. And then one spy, Joshua, says, but God got us out of Egypt. We can, this will work out. And all of the people gathered. Like, this is what happens. All the people gathered, they have a whole lifetime of being in Egypt, and they have one moment where God has pulled them out of slavery. And what do they trust? A whole lifetime, right? So they, they, leave, they fall back to that whole lifetime, and they say, you know what? <laughs> All right, we can't do this. We can't go into the promised land. And so they don't. They go into the wilderness for 40 years because they, they haven't learned yet. And what does it take for them to learn? Well, what's the best way to learn? There, there are two best ways to learn. The best way to learn is either to be a child, because what do child, children do with knowledge? They just suck it up, right? So th the best way to learn is they're going to have children who they can teach all of this. All of these things that don't come naturally to them, they're going to teach their children so that it become, comes naturally to their children. And the second thing they're going to do is they're going to teach. That's the second best way to learn, right? Either be a child and be sucking up all that knowledge or be the one who does all the teaching. And so, that's, so all the things that don't feel natural are going to become more natural because they're going to teach it. And you're going to teach your kids for however long it takes to raise your kids. And how long does it take to raise kids? It takes a long. 18 years, right? You're done after 18? <laughs> Give me some hope. <laughs> right? So it takes these 40 years and these 40 years in this wilderness. It's not a curse. It's a blessing. It's the time for them to sort of pull themselves together, to learn to trust. After a lifetime of being slaves and learning to distrust and to fear, now they have 40 years to learn to trust, to pull themselves together and to lean on God. Now, that's true in our lives, too. It's true for us. To change is needed in all of our lives, and it can be hard to acknowledge, but it, 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 we have inherited a set of assumptions, around, a set of uh, assumptions about how life works, about work, about feelings, about emotions, about relationships. There are all these things that we have inherited from our family that at one point may have made sense. Like a set of actions that the, for the Hebrew people to survive under slavery, they had to live a certain way that made sense at that moment, and now it doesn't. And, and that's the same for us. We have inherited some things from our family, some of which made sense then. Do you think you raised two kids differently, differently than you raised seven? Right? I, you probably do. I only have two kids, but I, I have a feeling that three or four generations ago, when everyone had seven kids, you raised them differently. And so there are some things we have inherited that need to change simply because times have changed. There are some things that we inherit that should never have been passed down. There are things families do that just weren't healthy then and weren't healthy now. Right? And so there are things we have to... And then there are always things about families that we need to hold on to desperately, right? We're all this weird mix of family background. Some of it is healthy, some of it used to be healthy, now is not so healthy, and some of it has never been healthy. And that's just... That's the joy of family. Family is always complicated. But it can change. Right? That, that's part of, of the, the story of Lent, is that on Lent we're in a journey where we can look at our past and we can walk away from the parts that we just need to let go of. And we can see that it can happen. And I want to zoom, for, we've, we've been looking at this big story of all of the Hebrew people. I want to zoom down to one person. And, and this one person shows us how much this matters, and this one person is Joseph. Right? 
And what's the family dynamic in Joseph's family? In Genesis, in Joseph's family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them, here's a given. If you have brothers, they're fighting. And like, you know, brothers always fight, right? Well, the first two brothers in Genesis, one kills the other. Like, that, that's the start. And after that, one brother steals a birthright from another. And, and so, I mean, there's just, brothers are always fighting. And, and one brother is born and Ishmael is cast out and, and leaves. Like, brothers are always fighting in Genesis. That is the given of the, the, the patriarchs of the Jewish people, is they're always, the brothers are always fighting. And so you get to Jacob. And this this takes fighting and ratchets, ratchets it up to another level because the 11 brothers are out working in the field and, and Joseph comes out and Joseph is dressed up. Joseph is dressed in such a nice piece of clothing that the only other time in scripture this, use, this word for this type of clothing is described, it, it, it describes what a bride wears on her wedding day. So. If you have been talking smack about how good you are and how much your dad loves you, and all your brothers are out working in the field, and they've been out there sweating, working all day, and you sort of waltz up wearing something so fine that you could get married in it, did you show up to help work? Not really, right? You showed up to rub it in that I'm not working and daddy loves me more. And so what did they do? They sell them for money. Like, we were going to throw them in the pit. Well, never mind. We'll sell them. We'll, we'll let them die as an Egyptian slave. We'll make a couple bucks off of them. But not before we take that really nice piece of clothing. We rip it all up. And we douse it in blood. Because that's the sign of how much our dad loved him more than us. Right? And so they bring that back to the dad. Your son's dead. And then we, the, whole, the story unfolds. And, and, and you can read. It's in Genesis 33 following. The, the, how the story unfolds. And Joseph goes to Egypt. And, and he interprets some dreams. And, and the Pharaoh elevates him. He becomes the one in charge of, of the crops. And at the end of Genesis. Genesis 50. Here we are at the end. And, and uh, Jacob has died. And the eleven brothers go to Joseph in Egypt. And the eleven brothers are scared. Because what does that family do? That family fights. And they try to kill him. And he has brought them in and he's given them food. He saved them. But now that dad's dead, there's no one who can tell Joseph what to do. They're scared that Joseph is going to take them out. And so they, they go to him. They go to Joseph and they say, Joseph, you know dad on his deathbed? When you weren't there, just for those five minutes, right? Just for those five minutes when all the rest of us were there and you weren't, he just pulled us aside and said, you, go you make sure to tell Joseph to be nice to you all. They're making it up, right? They're completely making this up so that they can try to leverage this, the memory of good old dad to get Joseph to make sure not to kill them because they're worried because their family fights. And what does Joseph do? Like, he's got all this history. His history of his family is that they fight. And in this moment, he weeps at, in grief at how broken his family has been. And he tells them, do not be afraid. I'm not God. Even though you intended to do me hard, harm, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I will provide for you and your children. Right? That's the moment when Joseph lets go of the family history and he says, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to do something. I'm going to forgive. That's how God works. I'm going to be what God has called me to be. And that, that's how Genesis ends. Like This is the moment at which the family that fights learns to reconcile with itself. It's an amazing ending. And it gives me hope that not just entire people can take 40 years to change, but it gives me hope that families can change. It gives me hope that it is possible to look at our past and to say, that's not something I want to continue. That's broken. It is time to let it go and move on. It can be done, and it is what heals families. And to be able to name what it is, right? For Joseph, it was fighting. What is it for us? Right? We have to be able to name that. I shared last week that the, what, my personal Lenten practice, like this is what I'm doing. Um, 
is we're, we're, as a family, we tend to be scattered all over the place on Sunday, but on Friday after school, we're going to sit down and we're going to read some scripture and we're going to pray together, and, and that's going to be something we do. Because my history, my family, we don't talk about faith. Ever. It doesn't happen. Right? I am more comfortable talking to anyone else in this room about faith than I was than the second year Olivia and I got married and she wanted to do this sort of Advent thing we were talking about and I sat down and I just like... <clears throat> I had nothing to say. Like, I, I can preach for years. I have preached, I can't tell you how many sermons, but when someone in my family asks about what I believe, I just, <clears throat> I got nothing to say. And that's not good. That is not healthy. And I've known it for years, and, and this is the season for me to take, name that, and I've got to do something that feels very unnatural to me. I've got to talk to my kids about my faith. Because I, I want them to continue on after me, right? It, it feels very unnatural to me, but I can do it so that it feels natural for them. I can't change everything, but during Lent, I can choose one thing, and I can say, this is the one step, this is the thing I can let go of from my past. I can let go from my past so I can turn towards the promised land, towards the kingdom of God that Jesus promises us is ahead of us. We can do this. We can name the one truth that we need to be able to say about our families. We can start saying that one thing we need to start saying to people. We can stop saying what we need to never say again. We can choose something, a way to serve. Whatever it is that takes us one step closer to Christ, Lent is the season to take that step, knowing that with God, all things are possible. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand with me and let us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.